Casey Compton for Monday Night Reading. And in case you don't know, she wrote this book, In Search of You. And uh, this is book two, by the way. <laughs> this is, um, and not your, this is your second Monday Night Reading, right? Yeah, there's her first book, Fix This Next for Healthcare Providers. Um, this is a really special Monday Night Reading for me. I'm very attached to how Miss Casey goes through life as an author. Um, and I'm so incredibly proud of Casey. I, um, I actually went down to Somerset, Kentucky for the book launch. Mm. I'm sorry, Casey, but when I said that to people here in New York, they said, where, where, why would you go to Kentucky? <laughs> just, just to show how much I love Casey. I took a flight into Louisville. I'm just going to leave out the mishaps and then drove two and a half hours to Somerset, Kentucky for the book launch. So uh, that's how much I really wanted to be there for uh, Casey Compton. And the reason is I feel that Casey was born to be an author. And I really wanted to be there because the first book is a good book and uh, serves the reader. And she sold a bunch of copies and keeps selling them. And she did a great job. And this book, though, is from the heart and soul. So I really wanted to be there for this book. Welcome, Casey. Thank you. I, I feel so lucky that you were there. Um, lucky's not really the word, but but very thankful and grateful and all the mushy things. Mushy things. Yeah, Casey's not mushy, just so you just so you know. There's no no mush. Laura, do you have a bio ready for Casey? And Pen, I not only have a bio uh -oh. for Casey, I have a special bio for Casey because Casey's a little special herself. Now, normally, you know, I like to take what y'all say about yourself and just add a little something in here. We're doing something different, Casey. Okay. Casey Compton is Southern, brilliant, and a cactus. Now you might think a cactus is something squat and prickly and having looked up to and hugged a very tall Casey in person, I can tell you she is neither. As the resident plant expert in top three, I can tell you what a cactus is. A plant that can weather and ultimately thrive in neglect. A cactus thrives where by all rights it shouldn't. Sometimes they have to shut down, lie in wait, and other little lost critters flock to them for protection and comfort. And when the right series of moments come along, that's when a cactus does what no other plant can do. Seize the moment to experience miraculous and magnificent growth. When it rains in the desert, after the storm clouds clear, you can practically hear them grow. And when they bloom, they're breathtaking. Casey Compton is a Kentucky cactus, a woman who has rebuilt herself from the spare and fertile soil of her tumultuous youth and a poorly matched marriage to becoming a walking, talking magnificent bloom one with enough nourishment for the rest of us now the kentucky cactus care guide uh, it does best on a sunny beachside porch with regular applications of bourbon and the steady laughter of family and loved ones in search of you is casey's tender and triumphant work of self-discovery hard won and well earned and i'll share how to stay connected in the comments aj you lucky duck casey what a tribute Send me that. <laughs> you better send her that in writing. She can do whatever she wants. And she'll probably frame it. She'll probably put it on a ceramic plate oh, and paint it. Yeah. Um, Casey, I'm going to ask you for book fundamentals. Are you ready? I know, <gasps> I know it's been a minute. Let me check my notes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Who, for whom did you write the book? Um, For women lacking fulfillment and joy. Don't you think men can benefit too from it? Oh yeah. I think it's yeah. it's humans, but you know. Yeah. But you wrote it for women. And what is your core message? Um, the only way to lasting fulfillment and joy is through uh self-discovery and love. Love it. And what is your promise to readers? Um, the promise to readers is to help rediscover themselves, connect with their inner child, and um, find lasting uh, love, fulfillment, and joy. So, um, 
I want you to set up the excerpt, but before we do that, I want to remind you, for those of you that are new to Monday Night Reading, Monday Night Reading is something I created because nonfiction authors don't often get a chance to read from their work the same way that fiction authors do. So I decided I would just give them a venue for that. And of course, I always want to showcase my wonderful top three author alums who are publishing or on route to being published. What we do in the chat is we refrain from constructive criticism, zero, we do nothing of that. And we do put in the chat what we love, what resonates with us, a line we like. We share the chat with the author, which they love to get. Uh, so we hope that you will participate. And there's a bunch of people who are used to doing it. They'll kick us off and you can you can follow suit. Casey, set up this excerpt for us, please. Okay. Um, so the f what I'm going to start with is, mm, this is hard because I don't want to, I don't want to tell them what I'm getting ready to read. Um, you want to just read it? Yeah, let me just read it. Okay. Everybody, okay. Casey Compton. Um, the party, July 19th, 2021. The sounds of party guests spill from my great room through the confines of my bedroom and into the deepest end of my closet, where I stand paralyzed by indecision. My granny Sylvia used to tell me I was as jumpy as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs, and that's certainly how I feel right now. Each time the front door opens and closes, I reach out and steady myself against the opposite wall. I bought six dresses for this occasion. I try each one of them on twice. Nope, this one is too low cut. Nuh uh, this one's too short. Shit, I must have lost weight since I bought this. The sheer black one with lace and a rose colored slip is as classy as I can muster. Thank God I ordered it. Nothing fits me anymore. Nothing feels right on my figure. Nothing matches my mood. I feel more like Ellie Mae Clampett on an episode of the Beverly Hillbillies trying to fit into something to be someone, someplace I don't belong. I stare at the outline of a body <clears throat> in the full length mirror and barely recognize it. You'd think 30 pounds lighter would be a good thing, but for me, it's not. I'm tired, but I still managed to crawl into the Spanx jumpsuit I never needed until I had my third baby. Then I drop the dress down over my disheveled hair. I pluck the black pumps from the she rack and tell myself I can do this. I pray that for my guests, at least, I look better than I feel. I walk into the bathroom to take a brush to my hair. Jessie, an employee of one of my businesses, walks in unexpectedly. It's so like her to close door and walk through it with no thought to what's going on behind it. Damn girl, she says with a giggle. I'm surprised to see her standing there. She looks surprised right back. I realize no one has seen me dressed up in months. I've barely left the house. I quickly hide my discomfort with a question. Do you think I need to curl my hair or leave it straight? I never wear it straight, but the thought of running a curling iron through it feels like too much work. She shakes her head and tells me it looks good the way it is, so I leave it. That's one less thing I must do. I'm already late. I spray a single pump of love spell body mist from the second drawer below the sink. I inhale deeply until I have nowhere else to put the air. I'm nervous about facing my guests, but I know I must. After all, they're here to celebrate my big accomplishment. Today, I launched my first book. This is the moment I've been waiting for, working for, the last big shiny object that I have spent my life chasing. Becoming an author is what I have dreamed of since I was nine years old and operated a library from my mom's second floor apartment. Housing all the books was a pink bookshelf handmade by my poppy a gift for learning to read. And today, I am an author. At 37 years old, my dream has come true. I walk through the pocket door robotically, leaving the bathroom and moving past my bed covered with discarded clothes and slews of scattered suitcases. I hear the buzz of voices and listen to footsteps as they move back and forth from my kitchen to the porch. 
the one that spans the length of my entire house. I see their outlines from the window of my bedroom as I leave the room. I slip into the living room and touch the wall where the collage of pictures from my parents' wedding day some 50 odd years ago hangs. I see friends enjoying the enormous charcuterie board, a couple of colleagues from the office chit-chatting, and my oldest daughter, Mamie, stuffing a green olive into her mouth. I smell the goat cheese and blueberry jam, of all things. The Kentucky bourbon is strong. The wind that blows in from the outside brings a trace of oak straight into my nose and leaves me yearning for one of my favorite drinks, an old-fashioned. My senses are all alive and awake, even if my heart feels like it's barely beating. The bartender standing to the side recognizes my desire. I make a delicious chocolate old fashioned with orange peel and my margaritas are to die for, he says. I'll have one of each. With drinks in hand, I think about how I wish I'd had one of these while I was getting ready. I continue to scan the room my eyes are drawn to a long table stacked with decorative boxes and a mound of my books on display. My books. It's the perfect centerpiece for the occasion. I see my author headshot that I initially resisted sneering at me from the back, and I can't help but giggle a little. I take it all in. I think about the people and things that have influenced me, and when I see the vintage German Shepherd bookend sitting atop the cabinets I had made after I bought the house, I stop to breathe. Custom made watercolor artwork that showcased my dream house on the hill, the one that I'm standing in at this very moment, calls the middle shelf its home. My children's piercing blue eyes stare at me from the printed canvases spread across the walls. They are so beautiful. My house is beautiful. I think back on a time when I was nearly homeless and was forced to file bankruptcy because of a broken down car I could no longer afford. I think about living in that small house on Richardson Drive that was infested with mold while working a second job as a restaurant server just to pay for Mamie's preschool. I think about how far I've come, how I promised myself I would create a better life than the one I had growing up, and how, for the most part, I have. In the last 12 years, I've overcome nearly every struggle one could have from major health scares to financial destitution, and here I am living breathing proof that dreams can come true. My mentors couldn't make it to the party live, so they zoomed in to congratulate me in front of my guests, and I'm relieved. I don't know if I could have managed to hide my feelings from them if they were here in person. They would know something is off. They would see my discomfort. Now they are here virtually, waiting for me to appear. I force a smile into my laptop camera, which is hooked up to a big screen television, and they applaud me heartily. I know what that means. I've done it. The degree, the career, the family, the businesses, the money, the vacation home, the savings account, the college fund. I've done everything I set out to do, and they congratulate me for that. Behind me, the girls at work surround the bartender and laugh. I hear the clink of ice as they raise their glasses in celebration. We haven't spoken yet, probably because they don't know what to say. I must admit, it is a bit awkward right now. One of them looks over and as we make eye contact, I feel a little better on the inside. I take another gulp of the margarita sweating in my hand and smile pretty. Perhaps if it's convincing enough, everyone will forget about the elephant in the room finish their drinks, and leave. My husband Jacob is not here, and that's obvious since he was always the social one in the relationship. Only a handful of people know why he's absent, and I'm not ready to tell a soul more. I think Mike Michalowicz, one of my mentors for his virtual attendance, right before I teased him for having the girliest glittered Zoom background, that's not a background. That's the wallpaper in my hotel room, he says in his Jersey accent. Do you think I would have picked this? I tell him how his support means the world to me, and then we say our goodbyes. I take a second to turn away from the camera and breathe. I don't like the attention. AJ, my writing coach, and one of the editors for my book appears a couple of seconds later, but I don't see her. I'm focused on the other people in the room, 
so her voice startles me. It's loud and clear and thick with emotion. I'm proud of you, Casey, she says. You've worked so hard. Proud? I made her proud? The woman who taught me how to write, who pushed me, who helped me find my voice, who encouraged me to trust myself, she is proud of me? I nearly fumble my drink. I can't remember the last time I've heard those words. Have I ever? Tears spring into my eyes and I hastily blink to hold them in. I'm not going to cry here, not in front of these people. I take another large drink and feel the smooth burn as the alcohol slides down. Then I hear my granny's voice in my head. Casey Renee, listen to her. She knows what she's a talking about and lay off the booze or I'll have to pray for you extra come Sunday. Well, thank you, I say finally and try to arrange my face into the appropriate gracious expression. You are a great teacher. She laughs. No, Casey. Well, I mean, yes, I am. But you are a good writer. You wrote this book and it's fantastic. You crossed the finish line. I just gave you a few tools. You're the star. My throat tightens and I know if I try to do more than smile and breathe, I will break down. I don't feel like a star. I feel like shit. I've done everything I was supposed to do. I made mistakes, of course, but I went to college, got a degree, found a career, got married a couple times and had some children, built a successful business, then built another and another. I had money, I had respect. In some circles, I even had a little fame. I crossed every accomplishment, every event I wanted to go to and every big purchase I'd been saving for off my bucket list. I bought a fucking hot tub just because I felt like it. And what did it get me? A damn chlorine burn. But I wrote something. I opened my heart and mind to my dream of authorship, poured myself onto the page, and today my first book baby is born. Amazon has been eagerly eating up pre-orders. I know because I've checked every five minutes. Today, finally, they will ship it to readers all over the world. People will hold my words in their hands and their businesses will change. I made my mentors proud. I made my teachers proud, but I'm not proud. In fact, I don't feel anything. I'm numb, empty. The moment I've been waiting for is here, but it feels like just any other day, just with more food in my kitchen and more people on my porch. I thought that after all my years of searching for things, success, accomplishments, love, respect, I would find the fulfillment, but I haven't. It hasn't been in any of the places I've searched, not in the relationships, not in the cities, not in the small towns, not in the power and not in the success. It wasn't in my job, car or dream house. It's not standing here in the middle of my friends and colleagues, listening to my mentor speak eloquently about how they knew I'd be great from the moment we met. It's not here. My life is not what it appears to others. My marriage is not what they think it is. At this point, I barely have a marriage at all. There's not much left other than a piece of paper that legally binds us to one another. There's no connection, no communication, and certainly no understanding or empathy. I'm tired of pursuing, pursuing success and still feeling empty inside, but they don't know that. I've kept it a secret from them and probably myself for a long time. But tonight, they're going to know. There's no way they couldn't. They'll probably think that my lack of joy is about him, about Jacob not being here, but it's not. It's not, I'm not sad because of that. I'm rattled because of something else, something I'm not ready to tell anyone about yet. The feelings take me back to a conversation with my first serious relationship, Frank, who eventually became my first husband which happened nearly 13 years ago when I was 24 years old. Go, Casey, he said, as our marriage was coming to an end. Go find what you're looking for, whatever it is, because it's clearly not me. You're not satisfied, and I don't know that you'll ever be. Those words have haunted me since the day he said them. They haunt me now as I stand here in a moment when I should be nothing but satisfied. 
Maybe I am selfish. I keep my smile fixed as I tell the rest of my virtual guests goodbye. Outside, the sun has already set and there are just a few red streaks in the sky as it fades into a deep midnight blue. Today is the day I've official, uh, officially became a published author and crossed the big to-do off my bucket list. And I feel like such a fraud, faking a smile and pretending to be happy when I'm hiding so much from everyone. No one knows that today would have been mine and Jacob's sixth wedding anniversary. Today is the day my attorney says my divorce petition is on the record, but no one knows that either. This is not the day, the life, or the feelings I ever imagined I would have. Sitting with a few friends still hanging around, staring out over a beautiful view of Lake Cumberland, I realize, perhaps for the first time ever, nothing out here will ever satisfy me. And that must mean that the answer I'm looking for is in here, in me, which is the most terrifying realization I've ever had. That's how the book opens, everybody. I get emotional when I when you read that um, for just about 10 different reasons. Um, <laughs> do you... What do you have next? I have a bunch of questions for you, but what do you have next to read? Because I want to time this right. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you wanted me to do the um, page 37, the dear reader that just kind of sets up the book of like what the book is, it, basically the promise, or if you wanted me to skip that in. No, I want I want you to read that, but I let's do that. And then I really want to share with all of you here that talk... I really wanted to talk with folks about the structure of this book and how this plays out because it's so different and and also about your journey getting to this book. Uh, but let's read. I think those pages are important for context for everybody. That was the open everybody and the whole book is their journey, you know, toward that promise that she shared earlier and uh, which, you know, the life she's living now um all right well give us that next little reading and then we'll chat okay um so just for a little bit more context I ended that first section with page 13 and there are a couple more follow-up stories to that and so I'm going to pick back up at page 37 kind of tells you how far we're going um this is at the end of every section of the book it's a letter to the reader so you're going to see this throughout each and every section it's called For You, um, hashtag I am here. Dear reader, here's the thing. I'm not a physical kind of runner. And up until this point in my life, I didn't know there was any other type, but there is. There's a fleeing discomfort kind of runner, the kind who uses subject changes, humor, and deflection. And when worse comes to worse, sometimes even sprinting to hide in the bathroom to avoid the emotions that make you want to dig yourself into a hole and never come out again. But I did it for 20 years until I realized I was just calling it something else because that made it easier. I called it ambition, determination, chasing dreams. I called it searching. It showed up in my quest to find myself by running off to Chicago at 19. And when I came back home and became a teacher, it showed up in my desire to become an entrepreneur and in the many ways I pushed myself. It showed up in my relationships, in my two failed marriages, and in my dysfunctional family. Now it's obvious that I was doing more than just searching, but I didn't realize it at that time. Even after I became a licensed professional counselor at 26, and even after a decade of experience with clients, I didn't see it. I was blind to my own emotions, I didn't understand the meaning behind my own behaviors. I thought I wanted to be successful, respectable, and to be taken seriously. For years, I believed that searching for more would get me closer to happiness, but it never did. It wasn't until I stood there at my book launch among friends that I realized I had achieved everything I worked for all those years, and I felt no different. I thought, if all of that can't make me happy, then what can? Change. It would 
take change. It will take change. I don't surround myself with people who will challenge me, listen to me, or validate me. I surround myself with people who support what I do, but not who I am. And that is the problem. For years, I let shiny objects guide my search. From that came five businesses, two of which were multi-million dollar ones, and one was pretty darn close. Shiny objects gave me something to look forward to, something to focus on, something to work toward, but I'm still running. I don't know what your search looks like, but I imagine it mirrors my experience in some way. If you feel dissatisfied, if you wonder that you might be settling, if you feel like you're spinning your wheels, lacking purpose, you could be searching. If you find yourself fulfilling a void with things, you might be searching. Or maybe you're like me and you're not just searching, maybe you're running too. And if you are, the only way to find what you're searching for is to recognize what it is you're running from. Let that sink in. The only way to know what you're searching for is to first recognize what you're running from. So that's where we must start. Fear. We run from what scares us. What scares us is probably what we need the most. I'll be here to remind you that you can do scary things. You can do this. We can do this together. I would never ask you to do something I wouldn't do for myself, which is why I structured this book the way I did. I'll take you through my process, doing it first, allowing you to read my stories and my journal entries, and then I'll explain it so you can do something similar. I will share my reflections, the lessons I learned, and then I'll give you instructions to try it yourself. What follows is the path I took to rediscover myself and my joy something I hadn't felt since I was a little girl. My hope is that by sharing this path with you, you can embark on a similar journey. One, remember your inner child. It starts there. Remembering who you once were, your inner child, what she loved, what lit her up, what sparked curiosity, because that is where joy is found. Number two, the awareness, the big things, what happened in your life to bring you to this point? Who are you now? This is how we grow. We must first know where joy is not. Three, understanding. Little things. These are the little details that give your life meaning. Your life is not just a series of random events. When you understand how the big things and the little things affect you, you can move forward with confidence. Four, change. Awareness and understanding bring about change. When we choose joy, it affects our habits, our hobbies, and how we spend our energy, ultimately affecting the quality of our life. And five, choosing joy. Because it lights us up, it takes every moment of life and brings forth an opportunity for feeling. This is the end step the goal of everything. Through my stories, through the practical applications you will find in these letters for you, and through the unfiltered rawness of my journal entries, you will find the path toward your own personal fulfillment. It may not look exactly like mine, and that's okay. Your journey is your own. Give it a try. Your back porch bestie. Okay. P.S. Just so you know, I'm calling you a seeker because you chose this book, and since you're obviously reading it, it might mean that you feel like something is missing in your own life. You just may not have realized it until now. You're searching for something, so you're one of us now. PSS. Oh yeah, you might want a dedicated notebook or stapled scraps of paper to see you through this process. Me? I used an oversized blue notebook doesn't have to be anything fancy, just something to draw out your life on, maybe with enough space to jot a few feelings here and there. Grab yourself something to write on, slap your name on it, and let's get this party started. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted y'all to have that context. 
it's so interesting because I have to back up a moment. I still have all the texts, in fact. But after the second book came out, and I didn't know what was going on with you personally, because you're you don't tell anyone till you sometimes you don't even tell anyone even when you you just go through life and we just can observe it and make our own assumptions but we were texting back and forth because you were trying to come up with book two and I don't even know how many variations you had uh, but I do distinctly remember that we were texting and I said you could give me a call and I was in the parking lot outside Chipotle and uh, I just did not forget this and just kicking it around. And the thing that impressed me so much was you, you knew you weren't ready yet to settle on it. And if it didn't feel right, you didn't say, okay, I'll go write that. You waited until you had, you knew the book you were going to write. Can you share a little bit about that? Because, you know, I, how many words did you write before you figured out the book you wanted to write? Um, I wrote almost two whole books. So I actually could probably publish one of them. Um, I wrote 60,000 words in one and then probably a good 30,000 of another. But the first, the 60,000, was that the one that was more business focused? They yeah. were both business. Yeah. Um, both of them were business focused, but you know, like I was very conflicted because you hear all of these things, like you got to pick your lane, stay in your lane, stay in your space, don't confuse the readers, you know, all these different things. And, um, you know, I am a business owner and that's, that's, that was my identity at that point. And, um, of course, like balance is important and, you know, joy is sort of important and all that stuff. But, um, I just felt like I had, like I was being disloyal to my genre. <laughs> and so I was really conflicted over that. And then I was just, you know, I was like, you know what? F it. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> and, and whatever. I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm Brene Brown or anyone right now. Like it'd be weird if she started writing like a totally different genre. Um, I'm like, no one, no one really even knows. So it's really not that big a deal. So it's just like <laughs> what I felt like I was meant to to write and not only did it feel good writing it but it uh I think I became a much better writer because I think that is the space that I'm supposed to be in yes I firmly believe that and also incidentally this is you got a traditional deal for this book mm -hmm. yeah yeah by yeah. the way everybody Laura's been putting links to purchase uh in search of you um in the chat we hope that you'll pick up a copy if it fits your budget if you already have one we hope you'll gift one to a friend um and then of course if you please leave a review it is so it's like pulling teeth to get reviews and so it's one of the greatest things that you can do for an author uh and there's also a way for you to stay connected uh with K casey in the chat um, let's talk a little bit about the structure. I'll be frank. When you first started working on it, I was like, I don't, I don't know what's, what's this going to be. Um, <laughs> but you, the, I liked working, I liked working with you on it because I could say that to you and you would say, I know. And then we just, you eventually you found it and you, this is something I tell authors all the time that pain you feel about is this going to work out or not is just un uncertainty that you haven't had any experience with yet mm -hmm. so the beauty of being a published author already is that you know I'll get there eventually um so I'm so glad this was your second book and not your first book can you imagine no <laughs> I was wondering what a gerund was in the first book and here like I'm writing in first person present third per like I'm, I'm in all these different tenses and it's just insane to keep it straight I'm like okay Emily what what tense are we in right now you know um I think yeah. we had to I think we had a big uh, several discussions about which is what are the rules of these books in this yeah. type of story it's present tense in that type of story it's yeah um but I just want to give you kudos to following the structure that uh, you wanted to follow can you share a little bit about the structure and why I mean for you if you guys haven't seen this it's storytelling 
conversations with a therapist, it's excerpts like you just heard where she's speaking directly to the reader. It's gentle guidance. Um, it's honestly, it's just like, to me, this is the structure is you. I will do whatever I please. But also the whole time you knew you were doing it in service to the reader. It's not like you were saying, I'll do whatever I please, read it or don't read it. You were doing it in the context of, I think this is what the reader needs here, actually, even though it might not make sense traditionally. Can you talk about that structure? Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, but one conversation we had, you know, you were like, okay. And you, I think you were almost like at a whisper because I knew you didn't want to hurt my feelings, but then I also knew that uh, you would also know that my feelings aren't going to get hurt very easily. And so that I could take it, but you said, okay, <laughs> this book and this structure is going to be really, really bad or good. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> like, uh-huh, I can tell right now. Like, I, I, I know if I can pull it off, it's going to hold the reader's attention. And, mm -hmm. and that part of my vision was I wanted a book that it was just like people could just read it in a sitting just sit down and just read it. Um, so I remembered that. And like, that was always in my mind. And then also in my mind was you confuse, you lose. Like I couldn't get that out of my mind. And I was thinking, okay, I'm like writing the most confusing thing I've ever, I could come up with at this point. So I was trying to keep that, but it was very important for me to do two things. In addition to that one, I wanted to take the reader on a journey in a way that I was not asking them to do something that I had not already done. And so it was almost like, okay, I'm going to do it right here in front of you. And then I want you to do it. And so in order for that to happen, I had to play with time. Um, I had to go from present tense and like flop back to memories because that's what I wanted them to do. You know, they're living in their life but I wanted them to go back and remember things and, and then start to make those connections of, about how memories are like threads and how these things, little things in their lives have so much more meaning if they just open their eyes to them. And so the only way I could do that really was one doing it first, then asking them to do it. And I think it needed both like my memories as well as my speaking directly to the reader. And then I needed them to also see like that those journal entries were real. Like, I don't even think those were edited. And I don't even think my editor edited the journal entries. And so I needed them to see those being as raw as possible because that's what I wanted them to do was write like that. So, yeah, I mean, it was, um, it was fun. Like once I got the tenses down, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a yeah it was a t you were definitely on a tightrope but you pulled it off for sure I'm so proud of you for that and I've seen comments I've seen people saying I I paged through that I just what you you set that goal you didn't want people to read it in one setting and I'm seeing that everywhere I couldn't put this down um page turner I finished it in one day finished it in two days you're here are you hearing that too Oh yeah. And that's, you know, I wanted it to be something super easy to read. And one of the things I really enjoyed about writing this book is all the little crafty things that you would try to sneak in and teach us nonfiction writers. I got to really use those. And so I don't know if, um, I I'm sure Laura noticed it and stuff, but like, there's all these little, um, subtle little things all throughout the book nothing is ever there nothing is ever opened that I don't close back up somehow from like feet to like everything has an ending and a starting and an ending and and the bookends of the German shepherds and like just all yeah. these little touchstones yeah I wanted to point that out because if you noticed everyone in that opening story there was a lot of detail 
the mm-hmm. German Shepherd bookends and just all sorts of uh, the whole the book is not written. The whole book is not written that way, but some of it is. But that's because it one of the things that you taught me through this book is that when we do this sort of archaeology of our lives, you want us to look for the little things and the things you love. And so some of that is in the description in that opening story. So it comes back to those. And I find that so fascinating because I've never heard anybody say to think about these just little objects and small memories uh, as clues. Well, and if you notice in that story, I'm talking about the smells, okay? Mm -hmm. There are stories focused on smells in, you know, Mm -hmm. these little, like with my dad and the Marlboros and the cigarettes and all this. I'm talking about the food that's referenced back to traditions, um, household family tradition. I'm talking about the suitcases, the slew of suitcases Mm -hmm. that that was a trigger. You know, there's a whole story about suitcases. So like literally every, the roses, the flower, like everything in that first chapter, which the reader doesn't know it because it's just the first story. But mm-hmm. as they're reading, I wanted them to have these aha moments of, oh, like that's what she was talking about whenever she talked about the suitcases on the bed. Oh, she must have been so triggered by that in that moment. Um, so I wanted them to have like all of these little epiphanies as they were reading, because that's also how I wanted them to experience their own timeline was like, oh, no wonder when this, when my dog or when my friend does this or says this I freak out like you know I wanted it to mirror my own experience in a lot of ways I love that and I'm so glad we talked about that so y'all could understand all that detail in chapter one is laying groundwork for the for the rest of the book I really uh we I I really need to hear the poppies can you do the poppy story so when you say the poppy story because you mentioned the helmet well the helmet story there's a lot of poppy stories okay 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 yeah I can do that I mean if you want a different one you could do the one with the, no, with the no, folding that's, chair that's um the story about um remembering um is good I'll do that with, with the, and then they, they can kind of see the how all of the stories connect with me processing with the therapist yeah after. so this is the part of the structure y'all is the the, the memory and then talking about the memory and therapy and that is something that she wants you to do as a reader, uh, even if it's not therapy. Okay, go ahead, Casey. Yeah, so this is um, the section of the book called Remembering. So I'm remembering the, the important influential people in my life. And I'm trying to connect that to now, the present tense. So this one is called The Old Man, Summer of 1995. I see him from where I stand at the edge of Granny's carport, rolling smoke lingering above his lips. Hey, old man, want to go for a ride? I holler. It's a beautiful day and a hot one at that. No better way to cool off than wind blowing through my curls. I long for a drive. Just a quick trip down to the boat dock at the end of the street to see how high the water is. The one where I learned to fish, skip rocks, and navigate the banks of Lake Cumberland with a raft and an old trolling motor we rigged up. Nope, he says. Too much work to do around the house. Maybe tomorrow. Her size Levi's barely cover his behind as he storms about the yard to look busier than he is. He often wore tracks in the grass from hours of pacing, reminding of a chicken looking for seed. Between him and Poppy, the green blades take quite a beating. The work is never done, he says. Gotta keep busy. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. His light blue cotton button-up stops just a couple of inches from his belly button. His graying chest hair stands up wildly and his wildly and his sweat stains are prominently displayed on the shirt, which he wears too much. His hair is disheveled, combed to one side to hide early emerging bald spot in the back. His eyes are a soft blue and aside from the color, they look a lot like mine. Cigarette ashes dust his chest and look like glitter to a little girl vying for her daddy's attention. A smudge painting across his right cheek makes me wonder what he's been up to, probably up and under that old truck again. The tiredness left in his eyes tells me he didn't sleep well, 
or he got up early when the rooster started to crow to make a fried egg and burnt bologna sandwich with a slab of mayo. My favorite. I notice everything. I drop my head as dramatically as I can in a way much like Granny taught me and sulk something awful. I feel his eyes looking over at me, but I refuse to look back. Get the keys, meet me in five. I snicker, but turn my head so he can't see me. I knew he'd change his mind. He always does. I skip off to grab a key ring, which he always leaves lying in the driver's seat. I rattle the cluster in my hand as loudly as possible, hoping he'll come on sooner than the five minutes he promised. I'm just as antsy as he is, always wanting to be on the go, always needing my mind stimulated in some way. I scooch over the bench seat to the truck's passenger side about the time he walks up to the window. Distracted by Granny in her purple pants, waving something in her hand nearly 100 feet in the distance, probably the ham salad sandwich, I don't notice him at first. I give her a good old southern head nod. I catch a whiff of smoke again, the old man still watching me outside my window. I give, a crank t- I give the crank turn handle about five good turns until I start to feel the burn of cigarette smoke seeping in. What the hell are you doing? He asks. Um, sitting here, I say. What's it look like? He sure does like to bicker. You're on the wrong side, Lillian. I ain't a driving. Well, then who is? You are, Dad. I look at him cockeyed. I'm nine. I can't drive, at least not legally. You ain't going to jail, and if you do, they'll bring you right back, he says with the shitting and grin grow- growing across his face. He is probably right. He opens the door from the outside and nudges me over. I scoop past the cigarette burns in the cloth and pass what is left of the stain from the spilled orange soda he bought me last weekend until I until I am behind the wheel. Ugh, and it's a stick, I say. I can't drive a stick. There's a long pause, but we never break eye contact. I really do have his eyes, even if they aren't blue. I guess the day is the day you learn, little un. I open the driver's side door and hop out of the pickup truck in a frenzy. I look up and down the metal storage building behind the trailer where he keeps all his knickknacks and doodads for the upkeep of the property. High and low, throwing up anything that might stand in my way, searching for anything that might help me. He looks at me through the windshield with his eyebrow raised like I've gone mad. What the hell are you doing? He asks for a second time with his head half stuck out the window. Looking for a helmet, old man, I say. A helmet? What do you need that for? We're driving a truck, not riding a motorcycle. I don't answer. He already knows why I'm looking for a helmet. And he already knows that I ain't gonna find one. So there's a break in the section here. So why did you need a helmet? My therapist asks. I didn't need one. I just needed to look for one, I say. I'm not sure I follow. It was something the old man and I did. Spoke to each other without saying anything. Their gestures, mostly dramatic ones. I was telling him that I was afraid. That I was going to drive. Not because he told me to. Only because he told me I could. I wanted him to know I was afraid without telling him I was afraid, I say. Was this normal for the two of you? It was. He understood my smart aleck attitude and he embraced it. Gave him a good laugh, made him think a little, and kept him on his toes. Yes, I say. Why couldn't you just tell him you were scared? We didn't talk like that. We didn't express feelings. We didn't share our thoughts unless they came out in a fit of anger, I giggle. Well, how did you communicate with him in that way? How'd you learn to communicate with him in that way? I don't know. It just happened, I say. Did your siblings interact with your dad like this too? I shake my head. No, just me. He was close with my brother, probably because he was the only boy and the oldest, but they always fought. My dad said my brother was just like my poppy, and my poppy said my dad was just like my brother. Their communication involved arguments and an occasional fistfight, and that's about it. They never apologized or addressed the issue. Just waited until they cooled off and acted like it never happened. That didn't work for me. I needed something different. 
but I didn't know what that was back then. I communicated in the way I was programmed to, non-verbally and sometimes with avoidance. I hadn't realized that until now, that that isn't healthy. What was it you needed back then? Emotional safety? Maybe a hug? I don't know. I say struggling a bit with the honesty of it. I couldn't remember being hugged by my mom. I couldn't remember being encouraged to share my feelings with my dad, which would have been too much for someone to process, so I kept them inside. I never had the opportunity to practice communication, problem solving, and all of the things necessary for a healthy relationship to grow. You know, I chose to date people I thought needed fixing, I say. After hearing it aloud, I realized that was kind of an off-the-wall comment, but it fell out of my mouth as if it needed to be said. You were baking cookies instead of picking ones that were ready to eat. Cookies? I ask. Yeah, baking cookies. You are trying to make people into what you think you need instead of seeing them for what they are, not just for what they could be, she says. Okay, I get it. I thought I was choosing people that needed fixing, but I was really the one that needed the help. I think you're right, she says. That's a pretty common thing for people to do. So that was it? That's what I am? A cookie baker? I'd been picking people who were still baking, taking a chance on what they'd be once they were done? It's often generational. We pass down unhealthy patterns to those who come after us without meaning to, and sometimes without realizing it, she says. I think about Pop and Gran, how they were the only two in the family who stayed together, and I often wonder why. He was like that old grandfather clock that hung in the living room to me, predictable, which was comforting. I wondered if Granny felt the same. He'd say the same words each, each time he saw me, always in the same way, always with the same hands that wore a gold wedding band on the left and a Masonic ring on the right. You said you needed physical touch back then. What did it feel like to be hugged by your family? She asks. I think back to those times walking out the door to go back to mom's, hearing granny yell, love ya, right before she took a long sip of piping hot coffee. I didn't even feel comfortable enough to say it back then. She must have told me hundreds of times without me saying a word. I thought about the occasional love pats and the lengths I would go to to avoid them. Weird, I admit. I apologize. I got old man and poppy mixed up. That is a trick. I shouldn't be. I should. I need. I don't know. I should be slapped for that. Old man is different than poppy. Mm -hmm. Um. I could just listen to you read these stories forever. Uh, you do have an audio book, right? Yeah. Comes out uh, April 30th. April 30th. Okay. So in the time we have left, it's important to me to ask you, well, first of all, I want to know, are you going to work on book three soon? We started talking about it before we, before the event started tonight, but are you yeah. going to write a book three? I am. Yeah. Do you know, have any idea? Um, I have, I have an idea. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's good enough. We don't need to say much more than that. We're just happy you're continuing to write. For the folks here who only saw, heard that first story, what was different about the launch party for the first book that we just heard about in the story and the launch party I went to at the theater in Somerset? Oh my God. Kelsey in asked me same question on a podcast here recently um everything was different like I mean literally everything was different just I am different um I felt completely present at that party I felt full of and I do want to say um like I had no family there like my family did not show up um and you mean even, besides besides Kelsey and the kids oh, right yes yeah. besides, besides like yeah but like no mom no dad no brother no 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 none of that um but even that even despite that I felt like there was so much love and support and 
um, just pride in that room that I certainly did not feel. I felt a lot of things, whereas in the first book launch, I felt nothing. So it came full circle. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a good thing for you to write a little article or something about that coming full circle and then bringing the book together, not to give you a writing assignment. Uh -huh. Um, to do that. And then I want to ask you about the, the question that I love to ask. That I wait to ask all night on Monday night reading. What's the change you want to see in the world through this book? You know, I just, um, Oh, I want people to stop losing time. You know, like I want people to, can I just say something really like a little bit of context? Okay. Um, two things. So a lot of the stories in this book are, are going back to memories of childhood and a lot of memories, like I didn't, I wasn't abused, you know, like it wasn't anything like that, but a lot of, um, things that were going on that impacted my parents' mental health that then affected me and my experience as a child, which then obviously affects my life as an adult. Um, there were, there was so much healing that had to take place and my mom is 74 years old and you will see the progression of our relationship throughout the book. Um, and how we, we ended up in almost parallel, like almost the same life. You know, I just turned 40 and like, I am exactly at the place my mom was when she was 40. I would have been if this change wouldn't have happened for me. And um, I think so many people just lose their time because they're trying to achieve and, and they just keep thinking, okay, when this happens, then I'm going to feel this way. And that is, that is the wrong way we should be approaching life. And I did not want to end up in the same ways that my parents ended up. And I think I owed it to myself and to my children and to the ones that I love to do something about it when I did. Um, and whether they will admit it or not, I think that my own journey and my own healing has also brought closure to my parents, even though they've never said, yeah, I really, I messed up. Um, I think just my dad two weeks ago, uh, after I launched the book, you know, he's 74 as well. He hobbles around, can't see, can't hear. I mean, he's just a hot mess running around. And he waddles into the pottery shop and he said, so you wrote a book, huh? I said, yeah, dad, I did for the last almost three years. That's what I've been doing. And he's <laughs> like, huh? And he said, um, never read a book before in my life. I said, well, congratulations. I'm really proud of you. That's a good accomplishment. And he said, but I read yours. And I said, you did. And he said, he said, yep. Stayed up till two o'clock in the morning, read every word of it. I said, <laughs> I said, oh, okay. And he said, he just looked at me, tears like pouring down his eyes. <laughs> he said, he, I said, well, what'd you think? He goes, well, I didn't mind it. I said, that's the best compliment you could ever. <laughs> I didn't mind it. So I think that like, I just want people to come full circle in their own lives and heal and experience joy and, um, and all of those. Oh, things. Casey, you stayed up till two in the morning. Yeah. I don't even know the man could read, to be honest. Like, honestly, I really didn't know if he could even read. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you told that story. That was old. That was old man, everybody. That was old man in the, who made her drive the stick when she was nine. Yeah. Um, that's incredible. I can't, I'm so glad you had that. I didn't mind it. That is high praise. That is high praise. I thought so too. Oh man. So what you want for us is to not lose time. Right. Us, your readers. Yeah. I want to, uh, we're just one minute over and we normally don't go over, but there's a couple things I just wanted to say. 
I, I'm fascinated by the very simple instructions in this book. There's actually, I got to find a pit. There's a, let me find the final one. I remember when I told you, you're going to have to do a picture of this. It turned out really well. Um, so the big things and the little things that Casey talks about this sort of archaeological archaeology of the soul. So this is Casey, what Casey's ends up looking like. It's hard to show you too well in here, but um, I'm fascinated by that very simple yet profound exercise. And um, why do you think that works? Why do you think that's helpful? Um, I think that it is triggering, you know how I talk about in the book, how you're triggering memory networks. Mm -hmm think that just actively taking it from your mind to the paper and then being able to go between your memories and what's written the visual on the paper you're activating these memory networks where in the brain like Kelsey taught me are like grapes on a vine and you can't just you you have to activate one for them all to light up and so once you get it, it's like that timeline is almost like a, a strand of grapes on a vine. And once you start getting it on there, you just start having all of these revelations and memories. So I almost think that why it works is because it's so similar to how our brain stores memories and stores healing capacity and, and all of that. And just by doing this exercise, you don't have to do anything beyond that in that your brain just starts to organize and that brings the awareness to you. And that's one thing I love is that just by doing that little big things and little things, uh, you get the answer, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I love, I love that. I love that. So I just want to point that out everybody, because you got Poppy, you got old man, you got granny, you've got, uh, Casey's mom which is a whole nother thing. And you've got people in her life today as well. Great stories. Um, baby in a laundry basket. Got all of the good little juicy stories in here. But you also have that big things, little things map. And so I love that this is not just a page turner, but super useful. And I'm excited. I hope you'll let me know if you hear from readers and what... Um, their own little maps i'm really excited to see what they come up with yeah me too so everybody we want you to get casey's book if it fits your budget it's a big help um to to purchase a copy uh you and also please leave a review please leave a review it takes it could take you a minute just a minute it doesn't have to sound like the new york times folks you could just take in fact if there was something that resonated tonight you put something in the chat and you said something that really connected for you, you could just take that and put that in your in your review. Do not leave a review if it's less than four stars ever. Just saying. Okay. Um, Casey, I couldn't, I mean, I just burst at the seams with pride. Not because everything I did, but this is, when I see an author who realizes that they put a dream in a drawer a long time ago and they're willing to take that dream out of the drawer, and pursue authorship in all of its many peaks and valleys, mostly valleys. Um, <laughs> I, that's what I'm proud of. Like I can, your talent, your view of natural talent. You also have improved your craft. You keep working on it, but it's that courage to say, I'm taking that out of the drawer and I'm stepping into that author identity. That's what I'm talking about. I'm so incredibly proud of you. Thank you. Everybody, oh good, everybody's purchasing, love to see that. Oh yeah, oh. Marcia's got it. All right. Everybody, we've got another Monday night reading on May 6th, I believe is the date, with Jules Apollo. Uh, Spirit Guides on Speed Dial is what we're up for on that night. Um, I've never met a living soul who talked about Spirit Guides in such a practical can-do way, but that's what we have coming up. Um, and, and remember that Casey's book comes out on audio, which I highly recommend you get so you can hear her read it on April 30th. All right, everybody. Thank you, Casey. Thank you for showing up for Monday night reading. Have a good night, everyone.